Hey everyone, this is Tammy Painter, and you're listening to the Book Owl Podcast, the podcast where I entertain your inner book nerd with tales of quirky books and literary lore. So, we are on episode 25, and right now you're saying, so what? Well, right about a year ago, give or take a few days, I released the trailer for the Book Owl Podcast. Yep, it was my vocal debut. I was as nervous as you can get without actually having heart failure. And before recording that trailer and before recording the first three or four episodes, I had the worst case of performance anxiety. You know, if I'm being honest, I really had to convince myself to get in front of the microphone. Now, as you can probably tell, recording is part of putting these episodes together that I enjoy the most. I think it's because I'm a big old ham in an introvert's body. And I can hear you saying, again, what is your point, you mad woman? My point is that the Book Owl podcast is one year old. So happy birthday to the Book Owl. As many people will do with milestone birthdays, the Book Owl is taking things to the extreme. No, not bungee jumping or parachuting. Maybe I'll save that for the second birthday party. Instead, we're looking at some extremes of book nerdy trivia. From the largest book to the oldest library, you are going to have oodles of facts to annoy people with when we do ever get the chance to get together and are forced to make chit-chat. You remember chit-chat, right? Anyone? Anyone? But before we jump into the extremes of the book world, a triple round of thanks needs to be taken care of. First, I have to thank Yvonne for buying the book Owl a cuppa as a way to show her support for the show, even though owls should not be given caffeine, but we'll make the exception in this case. Um, Yvonne is an Instagram buddy who I swear must be pen pals with half the world. She creates some gorgeous letters, envelopes, and all kinds of papery goodies, and I imagine it must just be a delight to get, you know, one of her letters in the mail. A second round of thanks goes yet again to Jonathan Pongratz for repeatedly, repeatedly sharing the show on his own Johnson Hans blog. And a final bit of thanks goes to Lavelle, who took the plunge and purchased some kind of expensive, if I do say so myself, Book Owl swag. It looks like she got a few t-shirts with the Book Owl logo emblazoned across the front. So hopefully she's enjoying those and sparking people's curiosity about the show as she sports them around town. Of course, if you like what you're hearing, I'm just glad you're listening, reviewing, and sharing. But if you are enjoying the show and want to lend the owl a little support, there's loads of very inexpensive ways to do just that by popping into that support link in the show notes. Okay, everyone, let's go to the extreme! Ah! Okay, maybe I shouldn't do that. Anyway, so before we start this, I'm going to put out a, I don't know what you call it, a caveat, an explanation, whatever. When I refer to book, I mean an item made up of pages that is bound together and held in a cover of some sort. There are some things that when I was looking, you know, up these random facts, there are some things that are considered books that are actually just a series of tablets or scrolls or whatnot. But for this show, a book is what likely immediately comes to mind when someone says book. Not a bookie. That is something entirely different and also something you should probably avoid. All right? So let's start off with the oldest book out there. And that would be the Golden Orphism book. And Orphism was a religion in ancient Greece and in Thracia, which is now Bulgaria. And the religion was based around the story of Orpheus, which is actually one of my favorite Greek myths. So, cool. But rather than contain that heartbreaking myth, the book is more of a handbook that describes the burial rites of the religion. This book is 2,670 years old and was only found 70 years ago during a dig in Bulgaria. And it's pretty small. It's only about five centimeters tall, which is maybe around two inches tall, and weighs right around 100 grams or about three and a half ounces. But for its small size, it's pretty eye-catching, as its six pages are made entirely of gold. 
And that's why it also has the other not so clever name, the Etruscan Gold Book. You know, and I thought I was bad at coming up with titles. But wait, what's with that Etruscan bit? Well, it was written in Etruscan. Again, not so clever with the naming. Okay, so at only a couple inches tall, that Etruscan book is kind of tiny, but it's huge compared to the two smallest books in the world. And yeah, I had to cheat here and go with two. The reason I had to go with two is because for some reason, the book Teeny Ted from Turnip Town, which is a great title, by the way, is touted as the smallest. It's a mere 0.07 by 0.10 millimeters, and that is smaller than a poppy seed, people. It was created using nanoimaging on 30 itty-bitty sheets of silica. There were 100 copies made, but while you're getting your copy, be sure to stop by the hardware store and grab a scanning electron microscope because that's the only way you can read it. Okay, so that's impressive, right? But a Russian man named Vladimir Aniskin created, by hand, mind you, not with some fancy schmancy nano laser doohickey, he created a book that measures only 0.07 by 0.09 millimeters, making it 0.01 millimeters smaller than the supposed smallest book. So I'm still confused as to why Teeny Ted is considered the smallest. If anybody has the answer to that, let me know, because seriously, Vladimir's book is smaller than Teeny Ted. So that's all there is to it. Anyway, controversy aside, Vladimir's book is made on sheets of super thin film. And the crazy part is he bound them with thin wire by hand again, by hand. So you can actually turn the pages of this little thing, you know, of course, if you have a special tool to do so. And again, you're going to be glad you picked up that scanning electron microscope earlier because you'll also need it to read this book. So be sure to add all that into your book buying budget this month. Speaking of budgets, do you want to know what the most expensive book in the world is? Of course you do. I don't care if you don't. You're going to find out anyway. Except again, the answer is a little tricky. Okay, so let me explain this. The most expensive book by purchase price was a copy of the Book of Mormon, which sold for something like 34-ish million dollars. The second priciest book at the auction house sold for nearly 31 million dollars. And both of those were sold back in the 1990s. But due to adjusting for inflation and the perceived value of the work, that cheapo book is now ranked as the most expensive book in the world. And I forget, I didn't write down what the value was. I think the value now is up to like $59 million, whereas the uh, Book of Mormon one, it's still hovering around about $35 million. So what is this pricey book and who is the lucky owner? Well, it was bought by Bill Gates and it's Leonardo da Vinci's Codex Leicester. And that was named for the Earl of Leicester who owned it before Mr. Microsoft. The book was created in 1506 and is full of da Vinci's notes on fossils, on water flow, on astronomy, and it has sketches of various things from da Vinci's imaginative mind, and it's mostly written in da Vinci's backwards mirror handwriting. So it's expensive, yes, but at least buying a mirror is cheaper than buying that electron microscope. Yeah? Okay, well, moving on. I like big books and I cannot lie. No? Okay, so if your budget doesn't allow you to impress people with the most expensive book in the world, how about the biggest book in the world? This thing required all sorts of special equipment to put together and is even more impressive because it was entirely handmade using traditional bookbinding methods. It was written, illustrated, and put together in Hungary by Belga Varga, and I don't know, maybe this guy just was really into large print books, but this thing is 4.2 meters by 3.8 meters, which is 14 by 12 feet. It weighs 1,400 kilograms or, you know, just over 3,100 pounds. And six people and a special tool are required to turn the pages. But don't worry, it is a big book, but it shouldn't take you that long to read because it only has 346 pages. And I'm going to bet a lot of those pages are taken up with pictures, since the book is all about the animals, the plants, and the geology of Belga's small village. 
But what will take you a long time to read is what's been deemed as the world's longest book. This is the romantic tale Atelmen ou le Grand Cirou, and it was written in the 17th century by Madeleine de Scudery, who apparently had a lot of time on her hands. It's so long, it couldn't be bound into a single book, and was instead put into 10 volumes of romance novel splendor. I couldn't find any concrete evidence of whether Fabio was on any of the covers, but I also couldn't find any evidence that said he wasn't on the covers. So, how big is big? Or how long is long? Well, this book is a whopping 2.1 million words. To put that in perspective, the average novel these days is around 60 to 80,000 words. And the massive tome War and Peace, that's about 550,000 words. So, do you think you're ready to tackle this behemoth? Are you ready to add it to your to-read list? Well, you're in luck, because Ottoman is in the public domain. But fair warning before you dive in, it does only get a 2.9 star average on Goodreads. So, you know. So let's close the books and take a look at extreme places to get some books. And just as we started with the world's oldest book, let's start with the world's oldest library. Or let's try to, because again, I'm a little confused on this bit of trivia. The place that's touted as the oldest library was started in 859 Common Era. It's the al Korowian Library and was founded by Fatima Alfiri, who was the daughter of a wealthy Tunisian merchant. And she also founded the Korowian Mosque and the Korowian University. So kudos to her. And for Korowian, I did practice that pronunciation with how to pronounce.com. So even if I didn't get it right, I hope I got it close. Anyway, so Fatima's library fell into disrepair and had to be shut down for a while, except to certain scholars. Then in 2012, a renovation project began, and the library was finally reopened to the public in 2017. So 859 Common Era, that's pretty old, and like I said, it is ranked as the oldest library. But there's another library at the foot of Mount Sinai that was started around 550 Common Era, and this is the St. Catherine's Monastery Library, and not only is it easier to pronounce, it's also been in continuous use ever since it began. So I'm still not sure why this one isn't considered the oldest library, and I couldn't find a concrete answer to that. My thought is maybe because it's not exactly a public library, it's more of a religious library. I don't know. So again, if you happen to know why, please let me know because it's really bugging me. Anyway, St. Catharines is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it does house the second largest collection of ancient manuscripts in the world. The library that has the largest collection of ancient manuscripts is in Vatican City. And look at that, you got two extremes for the price of one. Oh no, here we go again. I like big libraries and I cannot lie. Still no? Okay. Well, we have a raging battle here of who has the largest library in the world. And by largest, I don't mean by square footage, I mean by collection size. So, in one corner, we have the British Library. And in the other corner, we have the Library of Congress. And it's going to be a big old smackdown. No, it's not really. So, here's the deal. According to the Wikipedia gurus, both the British Library and the Library of Congress have 170 million items in their collection. Although the British Library, I think, might be trying to squeeze a few more items in by listing their collection size at 170 to 200 million. You know, like they're not sure, or maybe like they don't want to concede to us pesky Americans. Uh, really, I wouldn't blame them. You know, okay, so fair enough, all's fair in library love and war. Still, number fudging or not, these collections are impressive because the next largest library in the list is the Shanghai Library with a mere 59 million items. It's like they're not even trying to win. Sheesh. So now we finally come to our last extreme, and I'm sure you're glad because you're probably tired of my stupid jokes. For this, we're looking at the world's oldest bookstore, and after seeing this place, I really want to go there. It's called Bertrand's Bookstore, and it's located in Lisbon, Portugal, and it opened its doors in 1732. 
Unfortunately, the bookstore itself doesn't date to 1732, even though, you know, the business itself does. See, the bookstore was toppled in a massive earthquake in 1755. But fear not, because that bookstore really wanted to hold on to the oldest bookstore title, and it rebuilt very soon after the earthquake. So hurrah to you, Bertrands, for being the oldest library and for, you know, being real go-getters to hold on to that status. And someday, when I can travel again, I will be browsing your aisles. So that is it for extremes, everyone, except now the book owl is wandering around and wondering where the world's largest birthday cake might be found. While the bakers get the ovens ready, how about a few updates? I am very, very, very happy to say that the worst is over in my writing world. Well, for now, anyway. I just wrapped up the final big edit on the third Cassie Black book, which means the hardest work for the trilogy is done. I'll still be doing another proofread of book two, and I'll possibly give book three one or two more passes, depending on how you know, bad that first pass goes. But these really are just going to be proofreading and making tiny tweaks to the language. There's nothing major going on here. And so hopefully it won't take too long, which is good because my red pen is nearly out of ink after the last blast of edits I did on both books earlier this month. And I'm going to tell you that really was a bit of misery. I read book two and edited it. Ed, that's a hard word to say. Edited it one week Mostly minor edits, but it was still time consuming. And then the following week, I read and edited book three. And that was a pretty grueling edit going over my own changes and fixing some, I can't say the word suggestions today, and fixing some suggestions for, for my beta readers. I can't say any words today now. But seriously, at this point, I hate my own words. But at the end of that second week, I felt a huge amount of relief. As I've said before, as far as writing goes, I have had more fun than ever writing this trilogy, but the pace to get these last two books done and ready for my review team and for publication has been a little insane. And, um, oh, speaking of review teams, if you want to join mine, there is going to be a link in the show notes to apply. It's a quick and easy application, but if you like to review books and if you want to see my stuff before anyone else, I'd encourage you to check that out. Okay, my book-loving friends, that is it for this birthday bonanza. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please, please, please share it with just one other person, leave a review, or pop into that link to show your support. Have a great couple weeks, and I will hoot at you next time. The Book Owl Podcast is a production of Daisy Dog Media. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved. The theme music was composed by Kevin McLeod. Audio processing by ophonic.com. Video production by headliner.app.